All right. Well, good morning, everybody, um, and welcome. I'm Kate Keller, the president of the Harvest Foundation, and uh, we wanted to extend a thank you to all of you for attending this morning. I'd like to especially welcome and thank the Harvest Foundation board members that are here, um, not only for your attendance today, but for all the work that you've put into this plan that we're going to share with you all this morning. I would also like to welcome any elected officials that may be joining us this morning. We are really excited that you're here and that we get to share with you the result of our community-driven strategic planning process. Many of you participated in that process, and we really appreciate the time you offered us last year. Harvest used this as a community plan. Harvest resources cannot accomplish this work alone. We need the support of all of you and many others to meet the needs of our community. This plan was developed through the use of data, community input, local expertise, and the use of an intentional equity lens. Significant parts of this plan came directly from the work groups that spent last summer working on all of these issues we're gonna talk about today. However, before we look into the future, we'd like to celebrate the past and share with some of you, share with all of you some of the successes that we've had over the years. You should all know that most of you played a very significant role and should be very proud in what we've been able to achieve. Harvest's previous strategic plan had a specific focus on economic development with priorities of building a ready workforce, a strong tax base, and building and leveraging community investment for community revitalization. Through our work with all of you, our community partners, we've seen positive change and progress. In economic development, we have new companies such as Press Glass, Crown Holdings, and Shock, and business expansions that have resulted in over 2,100 new jobs and almost $450 million in new capital investment that directly impacts our local tax base. Our unemployment rates have dropped the lowest that we have seen in over 20 years. We helped create a simulation lab at SOVA Health that allows nursing students at Patrick and Henry Community College the opportunity to train on complex, real-life patient care scenarios, which was a game changer during COVID for those students. Due to Medicaid expansion, we were able to help over 2,000 people get connected to healthcare. As part of our education and workforce joint efforts, we piloted and expanded the SEED program which guarantees college for all of our high school, high school graduates. And that's now guaranteed for the next 13 years. In community revitalization, we expanded the marina. We added miles to the Dick and Willie Trail, which is close to coming to 10 miles of seamless trail. And we supported the development of the new Uptown Partnership, who was leading a community visioning process for creation of an Uptown revitalization plan. Housing and broadband, two very big issues where we've had local collaboratives study those issues and design plans to address them. Many projects in these areas are underway and we will continue these efforts going forward. And of course, COVID. Now COVID was not in the strategic plan, but we had to be responsive to the needs of our community. And through that, we set up, so help set up testing and vaccine sites, addressing childcare needs and challenges, provided supports to our nonprofits and small businesses, helped support food insecurity issues, and encouraged local people to mask up. We invested a little around $1.8 million in COVID relief efforts and helped to leverage an additional $2 million into our community. So there are a lot more highlights than we can share today. So look for a report later this year that will go over more achievements and lessons that we've learned over the years. So last year, we reviewed what we learned, looked at current data, and worked with our community to understand current needs and priorities. Despite our success with new jobs and investment, our poverty rates have not budged, and it still persists, persists here in MHC. We learned that many in our community feel invisible and not engaged, that our community shares a general lack of hope and optimism. People feel stuck and don't see a common vision for the future. Through this process, 
the board decided to change the vision and the mission of the foundation to reflect our current environment. So I'm pleased to share with you today, Harvest Foundation's new vision and mission. Our vision is that we have a community where everyone shares in the promise of an MHC that is healthy, prosperous, and vibrant. And our mission is that in partnership with the diverse people and organizations that call MHC home, the Harvest Foundation serves as a long-term catalyst, advocate, and investor to make our community a welcoming place where all can thrive. As you can see, we are emphasizing inclusion and that all that reside and work here in MHC should have the opportunity to thrive and to have hope for a positive future. So to dive deeper into this plan, I'm gonna turn it over to Cheryl Agee, our Senior Operations Officer. Thank you. Morning, everyone. As we began our planning process to determine next steps for the foundation, we looked back to see what worked, what didn't, what needs still existed based on data, but most importantly, we also listened to community voices to hear your perspective on local needs and priorities. The data showed us that despite new jobs and investment, our poverty rates haven't changed, and there are many in our community who still struggle to move ahead economically even if they're working as they often earn too much money to be considered in poverty, but not enough to make ends meet. We saw that uh, the data showed us that there are education and pay inequalities. While we are seeing progress in educational attainment in our community through programs such as SEED, there's still work to do as one in four people in our community don't have a post-secondary education, which impacts their long-term earning potential. Data also showed us that there are also pay inequalities, even with education, as single women will likely need some college to make a living wage in MHC, while a single man can earn a living regardless of educational attainment. There are continued challenges also with limited access and affordability of broadband, transportation and housing. And we continue to see health challenges as addiction remains a long-term problem and concerns with mental health increasing. There are also, we also saw continued decline in our population. However, that population loss is slowing, which suggests to us that we have turned a corner. With the population change, our community is becoming more diverse with an increased Hispanic Latinx population. In development of our new plan, it took almost a year as we wanted to allow enough time to hear what the community had to say through focus groups, surveys, but most importantly, by inviting people to join us at the table as we talked about needs, priorities, and solutions. Through those conversations, we heard that there is a shared general lack of hope and optimism the people often feel stuck and don't see a common vision for our shared future. The feel that the community doesn't always have a voice and that decisions are made without their input. That our community isn't as welcoming as one might think and that there are parts of our community that actually feel invisible. White versus people of color perceptions of the community differ but the majority feel that it is important that we make space for conversations about race, inclusion, and equity. People are hesitant to access addiction and mental health services, often because of a perceived stigma that's associated with accessing those services. They shared what they felt were, should be our top priorities in the community, uh, a need for more jobs, better pay, and benefits a perception that isn't quite aligned with our current reality. And they voiced education as a top priority with a need for more funding to attract and retain quality teachers for continued investment in our schools and children's education and future. Building upon our last strategic plan, those successes, as well as the gaps, as well as priorities lifted up by the community we're pleased to share our new 2022-26 strategic plan 
which will be an investment in hope. This includes our new mission and vision for MHC, where everyone shares in a promise of a welcoming community that is healthy, prosperous, and vibrant, and where everyone can envision a positive future for themselves and the community. And the North Star of our plan is hope, as we feel it signifies our desire to help build a community we all have a voice and feel empowered to make a change, however small. I now like to turn it over to DeWitt House, our senior programming officer, to share a new strategic goals. Thank you, Cheryl. <clears throat> and you're looking at, uh, and as far as our goals, we're looking at three priority areas. Uh, that being uh, thriving youth. And what I'd like to share with you is, is just some of the projects that we're currently investing in and will continue, or the types of projects and things that we will be looking to invest in in the future. And in the area of thriving youth, we're looking at uh, first class learning, first class learning opportunities and development for, for early childhood uh, with, with the specific emphasis on uh, quality. Uh, as well as affordability, uh, projects that are focused on workforce development uh, in the early childhood area. And of course, uh, anything dealing with the, our signature initiative, which is the seed program. Uh, with a vibrant community, um, you know, we're looking <clears throat> at, a, you know, again, a healthy community is, is a vibrant community. Uh, so we're looking to invest or continue investing in uh, Areas, you know, specifically dealing with what, with coming out of the pandemic, areas dealing with mental health, substance abuse, with a special emphasis uh, also on uh, destigmatizing the use of these services. So we will be looking at projects in, in those areas. Also, uh, in as far as a vibrant community, looking at improving our housing capacity uh, with uh, focus on affordability. And also, as Kate mentioned earlier, the expansion of broadband, which the pandemic has exposed as a, a significant area of uh, which uh, rural areas need, need improvement. Um, we will be looking at revitalizing, uh, working on revitalizing our entire community with a focus on uptown being a, um, a hub and looking to help create a space in which there will be honest conversations re regarding uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion. Uh, we'll also you know, be looking uh, in terms of our uh, third focus area, resilient and diverse economies, to continue our work that we've done over the last 10 years uh, in, in terms of economic development, increasing jobs, tax base, so forth. Um, we're also looking at developing, helping to develop in the uptown area, uh, an ecos an econ entrepreneurial ecosystem, which again is a part of that resilient and diverse economy. Um, and as Kate mentioned earlier, you know we we've seen that increase in jobs and wages, but we also want to focus on not only focus on who's thriving but who's not, uh, and then trying to figure out why. And again, to again with a focus on trying to break that vicious circle of, of poverty. Uh, we'll also be looking at continuing investment in our uh, nonprofit community, helping to build capacity so that they can continue to meet people where they are and help them move forward uh, in this. And also we'll be focusing on our uh, operational excellence here at the foundation, ensuring that our practices are equitable and also continue to work, develop strong partnerships. So those are some of the areas that we're looking to invest in and continue investing. Thank you. Now we'd like to ask Josh Blockus, who is the owner of the ground floor, to share with us um, as a participant in our strategic planning process, his experience. Josh, over to you. All right, well, good morning, everybody. Like Kate said, my name is Josh Blockus, and I'm the owner of the ground floor here in Martinsville. Um, and I just wanted to add a little bit of perspective um, to this conversation, just as a community member, um, as a local business owner here. Um, so, 
Let's see, I, I first heard rumblings about the strategic plan back in July of last year. So um, this conversation has been going on for a little bit, um, but uh, I, I just wanted to speak to the method of developing this plan um, more than anything, because it's actually one of my favorite parts of this whole project. Um, so when, when larger companies or larger nonprofits um, seek to develop a strategic plan, a lot of times that means um, they'll get a few folks together in a boardroom and those, those few voices will come and, and you know, kind of bring their perspectives or their motivations or even their biases um, into the room and, and you know, kind of hash out a plan. Um, Harvest took kind of the, honestly, the, the harder approach and the, the road less traveled um, and, and chose to, to take a holistic approach to this thing and, and really involve the community. Um, so, so like what Kate alluded to earlier, um, Harvest took the work group approach and involved, I'd say hundreds of, of people um, in the community to um, really develop the best plan possible. Um, so I was a part of one of the work groups. Um, I believe there were seven work groups and, and these work groups tried to tackle um, really challenging topics, things ranging from um, uh, revamping our education system here in town, um, revamping our healthcare system, um, building community hope. Um, building community hope was the work group that I was a part of. And um, basically it looked like four sessions per work group and um, each group was about 10 to 15 people, um, really from all walks of life. Um, so the, the real, real benefit was getting a lot of different perspectives, diverse perspectives, um, uh, different sets of experiences and, and really just tackling these tough challenges um, or tough topics in our community. Um, so without getting into too many details, um, I just want to assure everybody that um, everything that we talked about in our work group is actually um, perfectly reflected in the strategic plan. Um, so I, I, more than anything, I, I just want to encourage folks that um, this was not just a result of um, a few voices, but it's a result of many voices. Um, and, you know, personally, looking at the strategic plan, I'd say my two favorite um, aspects about it um, uh, would be one, the emphasis on K through 12 education. So I'm a, a father of, of two little boys, a, a three-year-old and a four-year-old, and you'll probably see them around my shop, breaking things and running around. Um, but, you know, it's something I think about a lot as a dad. Here in this community. And I, I think with the right support, um, namely the Harvest Foundation, then I, I think we have a real chance at, at revamping our education system and, and really making it something special. Um, and two, I, I love the emphasis on the revitalization of Uptown. Um, I believe in the potential of Uptown. I think Uptown uh, you know, has the potential to be a hub uh, really in this region for uh, business for entrepreneurship and innovation and uh, you know same thing with with the right amount of support then I, I think um, Uptown is going to benefit from it Martinsville is going to benefit Henry County is going to benefit so I'd say more than anything I, I just want to say thank you to the Harvest Foundation for listening and for having the humility um, to not just decide what this plan should be on your own but really take the um, the community perspective into account uh, to develop the best plan possible. And I think our community is going to be so much better for it. Thank you so much, Josh. I really appreciate that. Um, for our final remarks today, I'm going to turn it over to uh, the chairman of our board, Bill Kirby. Good morning. I uh, hope everybody can hear me. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Thank you, Kate. Uh, I want to start just by thanking everybody for being here this morning. Uh, as you can hear, and uh, as everybody has pointed out, uh, you know, there's a lot here. Uh, this plan is uh, all encompassing and it's going to take the buy in of everyone that's on this call uh, for us to be successful. So I appreciate everybody being here this morning uh, and I hope you will buy in. Um, I asked Kate if I could uh, talk about what you've heard, our North Star, which was hope. Um, 
So I've been a part of the strategic planning process here several times at Harvest uh, through the years. Um, typically the process, you know, the end result is something much more tangible. It's, uh, you know, we're economic development. It's, it's something very specific that we're targeting. Um, when we convened these groups uh, that Josh just mentioned, uh, it became apparent each and every group uh, brought up in one way or another uh, some sort of hope and more specifically the loss of hope um, or the lack of hope. Uh, and it became pretty apparent to all of us at Harvest pretty quickly that that's something that if we're gonna get all of these pieces done correctly, that's an element that we're going to have to address is the hope, you know, the thought that tomorrow is going to be better than today, whether you're talking education or economic development or healthcare, the, the thought that uh, your tomorrow is going to be better than your today came up time and time again. Um, and so we are uh, we're, we've bitten off a lot to chew, um, and I hope everybody will uh, get on board uh, because it's going to take, as I said, everyone uh, listening for us to get this right. Um, it's, uh, it's ambitious, yes, and, uh, but uh, you, know, you don't have good results unless you're willing to take a risk. So um, I hope everyone will uh, join us and um, I want to thank staff again for all their hard work. Uh, it's 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 been a lot. I want to thank anybody that's on the call that participated in any of the working groups uh, because without all of that input, we would not have gotten where we where we've gotten. Um, and so, uh, thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate everybody's uh, support and uh, and help with this plan. Thank you so much, Bill. Um, we appreciate all you've done for us this past year. Um, so this is an opportunity. If anybody would like to ask any questions, I um, will certainly offer that our staff is available to come meet with any of you individually, your organizations, your members, um, to go into more detail of what's in the plan, to talk about what role your organization could play um, in this work and what opportunities there are. So I extend that invitation to every one of you here. Um, but we are here now, if you would like, if anyone has any specific questions you would like to ask, um, please feel free to do so. This is Charles from Star News. Good morning. Good morning. I guess the first question is, what, what will be the first thing we'll see um, on the ground that you know that we that you, you were for, for the hope issue. You know, what's the what's the first thing that you're going to hit? It's an excellent question. You know, I think um, it's a really challenging question. I think the first thing we might hope start to tackle is talking about things that are already happening and helping people see the progress we're already making. So that is. Um, there are an awful lot of issues that lead to building hope, such as the availability of jobs and the amount of housing opportunities that we have coming up. So helping to spread the news um, about what is currently happening and the progress we're currently making. Um, I think the next step is we would like to work on doing a community narrative process. Um, I have said this before, and I'm, I'm not the only one who has said this, that this community knows who it's, knows its past has a common tale and knows what its history was and knows who we used to be, but doesn't have a clear vision for its future. Um, and I think coming together and putting together a vision of what, what we wanna be, who we wanna be, um, who do we wanna attract to live here? What kind of businesses do we wanna have come here is something we need, we need to do this year. How will you get the trust? Because one thing I've noticed in covering the area for several years is lack of trust in leadership. Yeah, I mean, I think the only thing you can do to build trust is to show up and to show up and to show up. Mm -hmm. So I think um, working with our partners, being committed to doing this in partnership with people, being open and honest with people, um, you just have to build it as time goes on. And, you know, I'm really grateful for the team that we have here at Harvest. Um, I think everyone here has really great relationships in this community that we can, we can work from. So we're certainly not starting from scratch. I can speak to my, for myself. I really appreciate just the discussion. 
Tom, thank okay. you. That's the first step. Okay. Would anybody else like to ask a question? Erla Taller, are there any questions on Facebook? Uh, no, uh, we have not had anything on Facebook yet. Okay. That's okay. I just want to know if again. Question, that's okay. Oh, sure, go ahead. Luis Romero from BTW 21. Can you give us some examples of some, I guess, some projects that you guys have done in the past, like seed and some housing? So the community has an idea of, um, again, it's too early to announce what you guys, if you have any projects in the works um, that you guys are, are tackling, but just an idea of, you know, what has been done in the past and what the community can expect, something similar. Yeah, I think seed is an excellent example, Luis, of what what leads to hope and um, and on the ground, it makes a real impact in people's lives. So, you know, as you know, earlier this year, we made a 13 year commitment to keeping seed going. Um, it provides an opportunity for education for all of our students. Um, and then it creates a workforce opportunity for the community as people as, um, as people graduate and come back and um, take these wonderful jobs that we now have here. So I think working on program projects like that will continue to do and look for things that are game changers like SEED. Housing, um, we have lots of housing projects underway. Um, the 2019 Housing Summit led to a study, it led to a plan, um, and we now have several projects um, underway. Doors will be opening soon. Um, I'm sure you have seen the Five Points neighborhood where they have placed the first five houses. Um, so we're working on getting those sold and building more and building that neighborhood. So I think um, there are a lot of things that have already happened and things that are underway that are going to happen. And I think getting out there and telling the story is really one of our key tasks. Charles works on you. I have one more question. Yeah. All right. Um, I've noticed that because we cover Reedsville, Summerfield, that area down in North Carolina, that have been a uh, a lot of construction of apartments and things of that nature, getting ready for the future. Are we reaching out to those people, those construction companies that can build, you know, apartments with numbers, you know, because most of these complexes have two or 300 apartments in the complex. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I'm the one who's best suited to answer that question. I'm going to throw that question to DeWitt and see what he has on that. That's his area of expertise in house. Yeah. Uh, Charles, one of the things that we, we've got several apartment uh, you know, plans uh, that, that, are, that are in the works now, not to the large scale, I think that you're meeting. I think we're looking in the neighborhood, we've probably got four or five projects that have anywhere from 25 to 30 apartments and maybe even one as, as high as 50. Uh, we continue to work with our partners in the county and the city to identify potential uh, projects uh, and also with the West Piedmont Planning District uh, just recently received I think like two million dollars specifically for housing projects in in our area so we're continuing to work various different areas and with developers and with the city and the county and trying to develop these projects on an ongoing basis but we do have four or five that are in the hopper now that should come online somewhere toward the end of the thir third to fourth quarter of this year. Gotcha. One more question. One thing you know we're, we're dealing with in the on the ground here is that a lot of companies can't get enough people to even come to work right now. Um, and with uh, Crown offering thirty five dollars an hour and things of that nature, it's knocking small businesses around like like they've never been knocked around before. Is that something y'all are looking at? I would. I'm going to say it is not something that we're specifically tackling. Um, I think preparing our workforce and getting more people ready for work is something that is in our is in our wheelhouse and helping our um, our community do that. Um, another area of work that we're going to be working in is building a small business entrepreneurial system here. Um, and I can let DeWitt add anything to that into that work because that is something that may help relieve um, some stress. But I think that problem is happening all across America, and we're we're stuck in it too. Uh, yeah, I, mean, I think we can we continue to work and and I think if you you look at what we've been what we've done so far with seed and what we continue to do with seed 
is we, we, we hopefully, you know, not, not all of those students are going off to four year colleges and universities. A lot of those students are remaining in the community and will populate our workforce. And what we want to do is make sure that they have the skills to, you know, to compete and do and to, to carry on on these jobs and so forth. But uh, again, I think that you're, you're correct in that there's a, a huge challenge out there for us to find uh, individuals to fill, fill all the jobs. And that's, that's going to be an ongoing thing for all of us in, in, in that sector is to continue to shore up that workforce and especially utilizing uh, what is probably the best kept secret in our, in our community and that is our local community college. Thank you all again for doing this. So we, we so do appreciate it. Thank you. Ms. Keller, uh, yes. Zeb Talley. Zeb Talley. First of all, I wanna reiterate what I said previously uh, to you and staff. Uh, I just think the tone of this is outstanding and I uh, want to certainly thank you for all the things that you've done. I, I just have a question. Um, I love the vision, I love the thought, uh, but do you have any safeguarding measures uh, to make sure that that tone of uh, equity and inclusion uh, is carried out with fidelity throughout this entire process because your goals and plans are wonderful. And, and just mm -hmm. again, kudos to you and the board for this. Thanks, Dr. Talley. Um, internally here at Harvest, um, we do have guardrails in place and we have practices in place. We went through an intentional and um, equity work to begin our journey last 2020 um, and built out a roadmap uh, for us to institutionalize those practices internally here at the foundation. So we, we practice our work through an equity lens on a very regular basis. Um, it is on each one of us who works here to keep that alive um, through all the work that we do. We consistently and regularly ask ourselves different questions than we used to ask. Um, and we look through our, our work in a different way. Um, that being said, um, we are going to do what we can to extend that practice out into the community, into the work that we do in the community. Um, we don't have complete control over that, obviously. Um, and experience will tell me that we will hit um, headwinds and some challenges when we, when we do so. Um, and so it is on me and on the Harvest Foundation to make sure that we're prepared for that and that, um, that we, can, we can help walk through those and with the community. So um, I can promise you internally that we're working on it um, and we'll do our best externally to help the community do it too. Thank you again for an excellent uh, vision. And again, kudos to your board and staff. Thank you. I have another question. Yeah. And you know, we talked about, and Josh Blancas mentioned it, you guys went through and contacted a lot of people. There was a lot of time spent to get input from everyone. Why do you guys see that important? Why are you guys being transparent and, you know, not just getting a select number of people and doing it behind the scenes and not even tell anyone about it? Why did you guys see it important to involve so many people? You know, that's a great question. Um, the Harvest Foundation is such a community asset um, and has, as someone new here, I can kind of get, have an external lens to the importance that this foundation has in the community to help move, move, move progress um, and to help make change. Um, and in order for us to do that, you need to do that in partnership with the community. Um, there's just really no way to reach the level of success I think we all want to achieve unless we do it with everybody versus um, us deciding what other people need. Um, and I think as we went through this process and brought in as many voices as we, we could, we learned um, on the front line that a lot of voices are never heard in this community. And we wanted to bring light to that and to, um, and you know, figure out how we can help communities that don't feel seen feel seen, and meet their needs too. Um, so you know, we're here for everyone in this community, and um, and I think it, that I think that's the underlying reason of why we reached out 
um, is that we felt that we, we needed to hear from everyone in order to, to do this work properly. Okay, we also, I think throughout the process validated that thought in terms of having individuals who had seen from the very beginning of the Harvest Foundation to now how much we had invested in the community, but also could recognize that even though we've made huge investments and huge strides in areas like jobs and tax base, we still had not moved that needle in terms of, of addressing poverty. So it was still persistent. So I think that also was a big push in terms of bringing more voices to the table. And my very last question, uh, Mr. House, you kind of touched on it a bit, but can you guys talk a little more about a new direction? I know that's what I'm getting from, from the new plan, a new direction, maybe some topics that maybe you guys have not tackled before that, that you guys plan to do now that, that is new, a new direction. Do you, I'll answer that to it if you want. <laughs> I mean, I think there's um this plan is a mix of old and new. I mean, I think you could solidly see some of the work that we've been working on, we're going to continue to do. So we are not stepping away from early childhood. We are not stepping away from healthcare. Um, but I think some of the areas that are in this plan that are brand brand new for us um, are really around um, some of the building around community connectivity that we still need to build out what that looks like. But I think one of the ways to solve people feeling invisible as having people engaged and heard. Um, and we heard over and over again that there's not enough, connectivity is the only word I can come up with. People were always like, well, I don't know what they do, what, even in the same industry, there's not enough gathering. And I think of course, COVID over the last two years has made that even worse. So how do we bring people together? How do we build community connectivity? How do we build local networks for people? Um, and it goes directly back to economic mobility, that one of the largest indicators of someone to be able to get themselves out of poverty is their social connectivity. Um, and if you have no social network and no one else to lean on, you're not, it, it's really difficult to do. So how do we build that for everyone in our community? And so I think building that kind of communi community connection is going to be new and really hard work for us to do. You will also see in our plan when you look at it that there is an intentional um, focus on reaching out to the Latinx Hispanic community. Um, that is a community that we, um, during our listening sessions, um, heard, feel very invisible here um, for sometimes for real reasons. Um, and other times, you know, there are reasons why people just don't see our growing um, Latinx Hispanic community. And I think building those relationships and working with members of that community to figure out what, what they need um, is going to be a new area of work for us too. Anybody else want to add anything on the team? I, I would like to also say thank you, thank you to Harvest for allowing Henry County Schools to collaborate with you all on this and all the other projects that we work on together to help support our students and our families uh, as we continue to grow as a community together. And that uh, we look forward to working with you all as we inspire hope in our community. Thank you, we look forward to it too. Okay, any other questions? All right, well, thank you all for attending. Um, I, again, we offer, we are open and available to have meetings um, with any one of you. We're currently doing this whole world on Zoom for the next few weeks as we get through this current spike. Um, but um, we look forward to partnering with all of you on this work and we think it's gonna be a really great next, uh, next five years. So please feel free to reach out and contact any of us if you wish. Thank you all for coming.